I'm Ruben. I lead the product team for block storage in Google Cloud. Uh, I think Sean already covered Hyperdisk, so I'm going to do a, a lightning go through it. Um, we're really excited about it. We took a step back and we really thought about what does block storage for the cloud really ideally look like. And uh, you know, the feedback coming from customers was a lot around having it dynamically provisioned, both performance-wise, capacity-wise, you know, decoupled from instance type and size. And you know, with the ability to dynamically uh, adjust it over time, uh, covering the full spectrum, all core workloads, and with each workload being able to to change, you know, scale and other parameters with, without suddenly hitting efficiency or TCL cliffs. And then finally, uh, with the ability to, to manage at scale, so aggregate storage management, capacity pooling, those kinds of things, but also policy-based management. And then over time, extending that into into workload-aware storage, where where customers can set uh, business level metrics that, that the system understands at the workload level, say, for example, for SAP HANA uh, rehydration times and things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, with, with that as input, we've been working on the next generation of block storage on Google Cloud, uh, which we're now launching as, as Hyperdisk. And uh, it's a full portfolio that, that covers the, the, the gamut of the different workloads with really uh, we expect the, the the bulk of workloads will 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 uh, find that hyperdisk balance uh, has them well covered in terms of the, the price performance profiles and so forth. And then there's sort of two outliers on the extremes. You have hyperdisk extreme covering uh, high end HANA, high end SQL Server, where you where you just need the utmost of performance um, and and uh, less price sensitivity, more of, of a focus on the performance SLAs. And then on the other end, you have hyperdisk throughput covering scale up analytics workloads. Um, and so uh, what, what we wanted to go into a bit more detail is why we think that that decoupling really is, 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 a, is, a, is a paradigm shift uh, for, for customers. In that, and I'm, I'm gonna skip through here, I'm, you know, if folks jump in if, if there's specific questions or anything, uh, but just with a look, on, uh, you know, looking at the, the, the time, I wanted to make sure we, we, we cover some specific workload details. Um, so if we, if we go through what this looks like in practice, um, Currently, as, as, as you all know, in, in reality, arriving at the right configuration in, in, is often this, you know, what is the, work, you know, the, the least bad compromise in terms of your workload specific requirements. Like, you know, if you take SQL Server, I need this many cores to do this, the, you know, the, the processing, the CPU demand on the instance itself. I need, you know, this many IOPS and so forth. You have business requirements, uh, you know, regulatory requirements, uh, different trends that you want to accommodate, SLAs from the business unit, uh, if, if it's an enterprise environment. Um, you have IT requirements, you know, the best practices, the templates that they've set up, and, and uh, you know, which configuration are, are common and so forth and so forth. And then, of course, on the cloud infrastructure, you know, the different products and services have, have their uh, dependencies and requirements. And, and, and we think that by decoupling block storage a lot more from the instance types, we're kind of pulling storage out of this like vicious cycle, right? So uh, I, th I think uh, this has been covered to some extent. So I'll, I'll fly through that. But you know, currently, if if you look through how you're actually migrating a workload, you kind of start with what you have with you know the workload requirements, and then you you, you sort of you know juxtapose that with like what do you need to do in a particular environment to actually get that performance. And then, for example, for SQL Server, you know, it naturally might only want 20 or 24 cores for a relatively small medium uh, database. But then when you're looking at how do you actually drive that kind of storage performance in the current environment, you'd have to upgrade the instances again substantially, right? And then similarly on the, on the capacity management without storage pools, you're, you're just directly having to tactically manage every single disk. And then, with Hyperdisk and then later with Hyperdisk and storage pools, uh, you get into an environment where from a storage perspective, you just have three dials, you have capacity uh, and, then, and then performance in terms of IOPS performance in terms of throughput, if you're looking at Hyperdisk balance and you can just you know, uh, vary that and uh, adjust that to exactly what, what you think the workload needs. Um, and so, yeah, you know, this is just in terms of like, you know, we, we know on average our customers are taking two to three weeks in terms of storage planning, the performance planning for, for you know, a workload to move. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of that is figuring out how do you square that circle of like, oh, I want this storage performance and then this TCO and, and the workload needs this and so forth. 
and and also just the sort of um, you know the the forecasting of a workload you know all the way from sort of the underlying business requirements and, and application requirements to actually infrastructure requirements uh, is, is a heavy lift for a lot of these right um, and so uh, you know the 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 whole simplification of, of, of storage then then you know bubbles back up in terms of simplified deployment and management. I think the the part that we did want to cover a bit more explicitly is, you know, what does it look like once you once you've found this new um, you know uh, configuration for for say for example for SQL Server again you have a SQL Server that needs 100,000 IOPS two terabytes of capacity that's you know medium uh, sized uh, SQL servers, it's a relatively beefy machine, um, but it's also not, you know, uh, one of those sort of Everest machines that you see once a, a lifetime. It, you know, you, you'll see that in, in, in most environments somewhere, right? And so in, in, the, in the current setup, uh, you end up having to uh, close to max out the instance just to get that level of IOPS performance. You still have local SSD for TempDB in, in both scenarios, uh, but then on the storage side again, uh, you're actually sizing for IOPS here. You're, you're buying 3.3 terabytes to get to the 100,000 IOPS, and uh, you know that's that's sort of uh, where you're at. Um, with Hyperdisk, you you can you decouple the two. You just look at the uh, the SQL Server, and 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 maybe I don't know. Maybe you're running at 24 cores. Maybe you're using 30 cores. You know, but but what the actual CPU requirements are on, on the workload side. Right, you'd still have local SSD for the TempDB for the, the the latency, you know, direct attached storage, and then on the on the storage side, you have a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of, you know, a you're provisioning capacity separately from performance. So here you size the disk closer to two terabytes, and then separately dial in the IOPS. And second, because the provision performance is dynamic, you know, we see a lot of customers actually their underlying workload requirements. They fluctuate, right? They have seasonal requirements, or maybe quarterly, you know, end of quarter reporting requirements that spike well beyond the baseline. Or, you know, in, in you know, in this example, we, we also often talk to customers where uh, a business-driven workload will have basically business times also, right? From nine to five, it's super busy, and that drives workload requirements. And then on weekends, they have a very different uh, pattern. And so with Hyperdisk, you you know, the customer can 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 adjust it dynamically. And I think the, the important part is, uh, you know, there's there's already ways to do this today, but today because a lot of the performance is coupled to the instance, the instance has to be sized for that spike, and you keep, you know, you would be keeping that at 64 cores, and with instances typically being 50 to 80 percent of end-to-end uh, -end workload costs, you know, you'd be jumping through a lot of hoops to not actually move much of the TCO, right? Whereas in this world, you size the instance to the actual workload requirements, and then you're dynamically provisioning the performance and, and, and matching the performance as, as you go, right? So there's no changing of instances required or anything like that. You mentioned application awareness, and I, obviously that's a bit of a roadmap. Like how far are we from being able to actually get like measuring mystery ratio curves and tail latency, like I say, a, a large reddish cast implementation on this so you could actually begin to tune the underlying storage to align with changes in 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 your miss ratio curves yeah so i think there's there's two things one is you mentioned like how, how far are we from you know being able to measure latency and so forth we are actually working on on exposing more metrics especially around latency uh for for block storage in general and then separately uh in terms of the the workload aware roadmap i think there's there's two parts one is give, get, giving you more knobs more metrics for you to monitor and, and adjust for specific workloads like look we're looking we you know we're running these workloads in-house getting a good feel for uh, what do people look at well, how do they tune their system and do we need to expose more metrics and, and, and uh, you know how do you reason through that but then eventually we want to get to a point where like you don't actually have to think about tail and latency for redis uh, you set workload level you know um, sort of business level metrics around like you know Here's the number of transactions I want to fulfill. Here, here's the the the, um, the HA parameters that I want to be able to guarantee and so forth. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a, it's a it was a, we're a, a bit away from actually being that tightly tuned to stuff, but on the provider side, there's yeah. a great opportunity. Uh, so yeah, we need to see it come together. Yep. What happens when a customer exceeds uh, the provision performance? Is the 
given some sort of grace period or is it effectively locked to that performance level for that duration, whatever the hours are and stuff? Yeah, so um, uh, so assuming that uh, well, there's sort of two scenarios here. One is they made a change and they're, and they're in the four hour time window. Uh, then unfortunately they, they are in fact locked uh, in, in the sort of initial version of the product. Um, if, if it's a stable uh, workload, like for example, you know, in these business hours, I'm at 100,000 and I actually need a bit more, maybe I need 110,000, then they can adjust and, and within minutes, the, the new um, performance level is reflected. Oh, it's a, it's uh, a manual operational activity required to change that performance level. Yes, uh, in, in, that, in that first, um, uh, you know, how, how we're thinking about it right now for, for early. And the two terabytes of hyper disk balanced, that's, Thinly provision two terabytes, so so or so hyperdisk balance. So hyper yeah, so hyperdisk balance. So let me go back. Um, hyperdisk uh, will exist both as sort of you know uh, fully provisioned as as persistent disk as today, and then later in 2023 we will also uh, offer storage pools where customers can optionally put these volumes into the pools. When they're in the pools, they will benefit from thin provisioning, data reduction, and sort of management by policies, right? So where you have like, you know, possibly hundreds of instances with you know, hundreds of thousands of disks managed consistently in, 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 a, in a particular pool, right? Um, but, but you'll have both options. If you, if you want to just think about it the way you think about persistent disk today, that's an option, or you can stick it into a storage pool and then and benefit from these things. And then you'll manage it, it a storage admin will manage the storage pool much like they manage an, uh, uh, you know, a SAN today, right? Where you have total capacity, you have buffer capacity, uh, you have thin provisioning, uh, you have, you know, over time we will also expose um, not only capacity pooling, but also performance pooling, right? So if you have a lot of instances and most of them are idle, but sometimes they spike a bit, you, you'll be able to stick them into a pool and, and, and benefit from that uh, further down the road. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so in this scenario, I had meant to the two terabytes to be just, uh, you know, tradi traditionally thickly provisioned uh, just to, to keep the comparison simpler versus, you know, what we tried to point out here is just the flexibility versus the instance size kind of trickles through. Not only is the, the TCO immediately, I mean, this is 50% reduction in the instance TCO, which you know, is a sizable portion of the total workload TCO, but then also because it because you have this freedom to adjust the performance and you don't have to go back and change the instance or size the instance to the maximum. Um, you know, the, the actual the you get by with less cores is because you're not required to have the east the uh, the compute at the same level as storage. Is that it? So I'm yeah, so right now we yeah we got the thirty two cores back from. So, so uh, in this uh, today, if I want 100,000 IOPS, I have to provision an into standard 64 or into high man 64, because because the IOPS the storage performance is tied to the instance. I could technically do this on one core then with uh, hyperdisk. Is that what you're saying? Um, uh, there will be a, uh, I don't know if it's one core. In the, it's a lot more decoupled. But at the end of the day, you know, for example, at the network level. Uh, the hardware still catches up with us. We've moved a lot of the block storage processing from from the host to distributed charted system, um, and 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 that decoupling of storage from from the host uh, allows us a lot more flexibility. Um, but you know, we expect by and large, uh, you know, for example, a, a one vCPU, a one core SQL server is also not going to be driving 500,000 IOPS, right? So by the time that you dial in your workload to the cores that you need. To generate, say, 100,000 IOPS, uh, you know the the storage isn't going to be the bottleneck. Uh, 